Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our lesson for meditation this morning is recorded for us in St. Mark's Gospel account reading from the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 26. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall I say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So far the words of our text. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, true story, word about our church has reached the farthest corners of this country. My mother and father have good friends down in southeastern Wisconsin who are snowbirds. They travel to Arizona and vacation for three or four months. And apparently, word came up about our church in Duluth. They were down in Arizona in the Phoenix area, area and uh, they met another retired couple who happened to be from Duluth, Minnesota, and Jim Poppins and his wife were so excited to hear that someone was from Duluth, there was a connection. That's what you do, right? You talk about connections you've made, and they said, you know, we have some good friends from southeastern Wisconsin, and they have a son that's a pastor in Duluth, Minnesota. They couldn't remember the name of the church, but they did remember that we were affiliated with the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. And that's all they had to say, and this couple knew exactly where our church was. And they said they would never step foot inside of this church. And even used the word cult to describe our practices. Isn't that something? How your reputation precedes you? All the way into the state of Arizona, talk about our church. I wonder why it is that sometimes the Wisconsin Synod, it seems like the lines in the sand are being drawn in this country, does it not? More and more, which makes our synod stand out a little bit more like a sore thumb. Why do you think it is that we develop a reputation that we might be cult-like in our theological practices? Do you think it's because of our stance on the roles of men and women? Do you think that maybe it's because we teach a young earth and creation, teach that abortion is wrong and sinful and murder? That the Bible is authoritative in all that it teaches and that it was a 6, 24-hour creation? Or maybe it's because we unapologetically say that Jesus is the only way to salvation and all other roads will lead to eternal death. Whatever it is, we can certainly say that our reputation precedes us as a church body. Today, as we consider the words of our Savior in Mark's Gospel, we consider the parables that Jesus tells, two of them, describing the growth of God's kingdom. Jesus says a man scatters seed and the farmer goes to sleep and it just sprouts and grows overnight without the farmer really doing anything to it. Has that been your experience with evangelism? Whenever you tell someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ that 
disciples of Jesus are popping up all over. You run a vacation Bible school and people can't wait to get there Sunday morning to hear more about the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that he has won for them. As it hasn't been my experience. And aside from Pentecost Day when 3,000 were converted, it wasn't really the experience of the early church either. Many more rejected the gospel than received it. So what do you think Jesus means when he talks about this inevitable consequence of the growth of the seed? Well, he's not talking so much about the converting power of the gospel as he is talking about the transformative power of the gospel in the hearts of God's people. Think about this for a moment. You were baptized, many of you, as little babies. You had to grow up in your salvation, going through confirmation classes. But I'd be willing to bet that many of you would not say that you're at today where you were when you were in fifth or sixth grade, spiritually speaking. That's what Jesus is talking about in our text today. He's talking about how the kingdom of God grows within us until it reaches maturity, then the harvest comes and he brings us home to the kingdom of heaven. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. You see, as a synod, our reputation inevitably is going to precede us wherever we are. Because as I said, unapologetically, we stand for Christ, we stand for the gospel, we stand for God's word. It's the final authority. And secular man can't change what God has declared to be true in his word. But what reputation do you have individually as Christians? What are people going to be saying about you? Or what are they saying about your faith? Because fruits can never remain hidden in a person's life. Fruits of unbelief will manifest themselves. Like the couple from Duluth who believed that we were cult-like in their practices, that is a fruit of unbelief, is it not? You can't keep these fruits hidden. A stagnant faith will unveil itself as such. An active and mature faith will reveal itself as such in life. So what will be said about you, or what is being said about your faith? As you can see, the Apostle Paul said, even before Internet was accessible, all around the world, people were hearing about the Christians in Colossae. Why? Because they had a deep-rooted love for the saints of God, the brotherhood of the church, and for God's holy word. Listen to what Paul said. We've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all of the saints. Is that what will be said about you and me? Do you love the brotherhood of believers? So much so that you gather together with them frequently to grow in your faith? Do you treasure the saints around you? Or are you just living independently on an island, practicing a private faith, just waiting for the church triumphant to take place in heaven. You see, it's not really a good thing if people in our world or in our country only know what we as believers are against. Because there is so much as Christians that we are for, would you not say? And if that's the only reputation that we're developing, is that, hey, that's the church body that doesn't like women. That's the church body that, uh, that uh, has these messed up views of marriage. Which, by the way, if you stand for marriage between a man and woman, you're going to be in the minority real soon in this country. But there's so much more that we are for, is there not? But if visitors come into our church and they see a people that exuberates a coldness, what does that tell them about our faith? Is it lukewarm? Is it stagnant? Have you guys ever been to a church where nobody greets you, nobody shakes your hand? 
They're all very serious, very prim and proper. They get to church late, they leave early, and they see to it that they don't shake anyone's hands. Have you ever been to a church like that? You see, love and truth are like two wings of an airplane, aren't they? You can't have one without the other. You can have all the truth in the world, but if you have not love, what happens? That airplane will fly in a circle until it crashes. That's the reputation we have. That's not a good one. You see, Jesus was both hated and loved in this world, was he not? We know why he was hated, because in many respects, he was rejected. But he was also very much loved. Why? Because he had developed a reputation for one who spent time with sinners who spent time with the outcasts of society, who worked hard to reach lost souls. And that ultimately is the reputation that we as Christians must aspire to, the one that our Savior has. Because Jesus once said, look, a student is not above his teacher, nor is a servant ever above his master. If the world hated me, it will also hate you. And that's okay. If the secular world hates us, that's fine. But they also need to see that we have a deep-rooted love for the salvation of their soul. And that can only come through a heart that is growing and continuing to grow and be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you get the analogy he used of the tiny mustard seed? It's the tiniest of all seeds of shrub life and it grows to 10, 13, even 15 feet as a shrub or bush. Jesus says, so it is with those who are growing in the gospel. Their hearts are being transformed daily as they are growing in faith. Jesus invites weary sinners to come unto him, doesn't he? Who are the wearied sinners, the burdened sinners? Ultimately, everyone, right? Even those in the world. But the world doesn't know that they're burdened by their own sin. Sometimes those in the church don't realize that they are burdened by their own sin. But the weary and the burden whom Jesus invites ultimately is everyone, and he says, I have rest for your souls. And that rest that he offers you and me is in the gospel because everything in the gospel points us back to the Christ, back to the cross, doesn't it? It's at the cross that we learn that our many sins in this world have been paid in full and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And those promises that he makes of restoration for us, like that little seed, tend to grow in our hearts and in our lives. You know, Martin Luther once talked about the relationship of a Christian, his faith and his good works, by describing it like an apple tree. He said, you know, telling a Christian to do good works is like telling an apple tree to bear apples. It's a consequence to what it is. You see, to be a Christian means to bear fruit in our life. To be an apple tree means to bear apples as a tree. But the one thing Luther wasn't talking about in that discourse between the apple tree and the Christian's good works was the need for fertilization. You see, I got eight apple trees. We have eight apple trees in our property. But they're like 70 years old. They're really big and old, and the fruit that it bears are way up. It's too high for me to trim. And so what it produces is these tiny little apples that eventually fall to the ground and the deer eat. They're not really good for anything. That's what will happen to the Christian who rests on the laurels of his baptism, which brought us into God's royal family. The Christian who rests on the laurels of what he learned as a 7th and 8th grader and says, you know what? I know all there is to know about my salvation and forgiveness, and therefore I can rest and take things easy now. That's a huge mistake, and Jesus points that out again and again in the Gospels through many parables, doesn't he? He talks about the man who builds his house on the sand. He talks about the man who builds his house on the rock. When the wind and the tempest of life came, the one built on sand was washed away. And how often don't we sadly see that Christians one day singing and confessing Christ, the next day they're lost and denying Christ. 
because they built their house on sand and not on the promises of the gospel. Jesus talked about the man with talents. One had five, one had two, and one had one. The man with five put those talents to work. The man with two put those talents to work. The man with one buried his treasure. Did nothing with his faith. He was resting on the laurels of some knowledge that he had when he was a seventh or eighth grader. What a dangerous mistake that is. Because the tree inside of our hearts that is produced by the Holy Gospel, it's either growing or it's dying. It's either producing luscious, bright red fruit because Christ is in us working through that Gospel, or it is producing bad fruit because we have grown stagnant in our faith. We lost our love for the brotherhood of believers whom we will spend eternity with. Jesus doesn't want that to happen to any of us, which is why he teaches us this parable today. He's teaching us that the word works. It's our mandate to use that word, isn't it? That's where the Holy Spirit chooses to speak to us, right here in God's word, right there in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Wherever we gather as the family of believers to grow in our faith in God's word, there the Holy Spirit is working on our hearts and taking the seed of the gospel, which has forgiven us and reconciled us to God, and then transforming that work into our lives, into the lives of other people. Let it not be said about this church or even us as individual Christians that this is what we are against, but rather, let it be said what we are for. You know, this past Christmas when we had our preschool uh, Christmas service, after it was over with, we stood in line for treats, of course. And a grandma and grandpa had thanked me because their son and daughter did not go to church, but their granddaughter was going to a Christian preschool. And they were saying how nice it is that their granddaughter is kind of teaching their parents how to pray because they learned that here with these teachers in this preschool. Jesus spent time with the young children, didn't he? And when the disciples said, get them away, don't be bothered by them, Jesus said, no, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. That's a great reputation to have. I was at Home Depot the other day, and I was checking out, and the lady said, I know who you are. And I said, well, did you have someone in the preschool? Because that's usually how it goes. But she said, no, your church used to invite the mentally and physically disabled to your church. We'd have two or three events a year. She said, I used to work in one of those homes and I would bring my patients there. And, and, and Home Depot, you can see our church from Home Depot. What, a, what an awesome reputation that is to have. That's what Jesus did. Forget about the people who are snowbirds down in Arizona talking about our cult-like practices who don't even give the time or day to God and his word to hear an explanation of what his gospel truth is. Jesus calls them pigs. And he says, don't cast your pearls before the pigs or swine. They're just going to trample all over it. Jesus went after the downhearted, the downcast, the physically, the mentally disabled, the little children, those who would give us the audience, teach them all, let them know that they have a God of love, a God who died for them, a God who forgives them. May God bless our efforts in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Amen.